Good morning. I will probably be approaching your subject from a very, very different perspective um, to the realm of poetry. Um, my belief, which has been garnered and developed over the years, is that poetry, art, music, sculpture, all of that, <coughs> reaches beyond the rational, well beyond the rational, and that we do need uh, to stop thinking every now and again and to go silent and to let the world in on us rather than we imposing our structures on the world. Um, I was brought up on Ackle Island, which <coughs> gave me freedom to develop my imagination. And I am going to use poems of my own uh, to illustrate what I'm trying to talk about. What I'm talking about is beyond the rational, beyond the physical, into the transcendental, uh, where the soul actually is in, at peace and is quiet. I'm going to make a nod to Percy French at the very beginning. Um, my granny, Lord Rester, used to spend her time in the kitchen with her sleeves rolled up and her flour up to her elbows making apple tarts and potato cakes while singing generally Percy French, but it was nearly always Abdul, Abulbul, Amir. <clears throat> and it's corollaries, the other guy uh, with the other strange name. So this was in my ears all the time as I grew up. Um, but of course there were all the other Percy French songs which I grew up with and loved heartily. I discovered one of them that uh, talks about the artist, and he talks about it in terms of the death of the artist. Uh, and in his case, it's not a poet, it's a painter. And the suggestion in this little poem of his is worrying to me. It says, he says that the painter does not choose eternal rest when he goes beyond the earth. He keeps painting. And that is worrying for us artists that we will not ever find rest. I'm going to read his, his little piece. It's called Sunset at Renville, a celestial painting. I do not want to be sitting at a desk in my celestial glory trying to think of new poems to be writing about. When painters leave this world, we grieve for the hand that will not work anymore. But who can say that they rest always on that still celestial shore? No, 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 they choose from the rainbow hues and winging from paradise, they come to paint, now bold and now faint, the tones of our sunset skies. When I see them there, I can almost swear that gray is from Whistler's brain, that crimson flush was Turner's brush and the gold is Claude Lorraine. So the suggestion there is there is no rest for the wicked, uh, namely the painter or the writer. I want to begin by placing a morning scene before you. It's a poem I've written called The Red Gate. And it is situated in a very well-known international townland called Drumkeelan Moor in County Leitrim, where we have a red gate. I begin with it as a notion of what a poem actually is, as I see it. How each day introduces the world, the old world, the new world to us. Always new, always caught up with questions of war, economies, peace, and the healing work of the imagination. Mornings, when you swing open the red gate, admitting the world again with its creeds and wars. The hinges will sing their three sharp notes of protest. 
you hear the poplars in their murmurings and sifflings, while the labouring high caravans of the rain pass slowly by. It will seem as if the old certainties of the moon and stars, mingled with the returnings and turnings of your dreams, fade to unreality. Although they rise about you, the matins and lauds of the meadow sweet and ruin. The first truck goes rutling down the wet road, and the raw arguments, the self-betrayed economies of governments assault you, so that you may miss the clear-souled drops on the topmost bar that would whisper you peace. So the red gate uh, has become for me an inspiration. Uh, it opens out onto the world, obviously, and then it closes back in on yourself. Uh, the red gate could be birth, it could be death, it could be all of those things, which is why I say the imagination is an absolutely wonderful thing. And I have a license, a poetic one, which means that I can get away with all sorts of analogies like that. <coughs> now I'm going to call upon William Butler Yeats, who saw poetry as a consolation to an elderly gentleman. Not just that, but poetry as a focus for the soul, for its vitality, its power to live on. It's a stanza from a poem that I'm sure you know very, very well, one of his very best poems, Sailing to Byzantium. <clears throat> An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. Unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore have I sailed the seas, and come to the holy city of Byzantium. So the labour for Yeats was a labour to find transcendence, to find uh, the soul continuing after living. And he sought, he sought that in Byzantium, which for him became the city of the imagination. So uh, I'm not sure that he actually believed fully in what he was doing, but it became symbolic, certainly, of the search for transcendence and permanence. The holy city is the sanctum of the imagination, of the transcendent, and in contemporary terms, of the inner room that Christ said was the locus of silence and true, true prayer. When you pray, he said, close the door and go into your inner room and your father, who sees in secret, will answer you. The inner room is where we work to exclude for a while all the physical world about us, where we silence our reason, our will, our memory and imagination and open our awareness to the ultimate reality, which we know by faith is within us. This ultimate reality is the soul that grows further into wholeness the more we absent ourselves from physical things, the part of us that touches on the whole of creation. And where we reach that still point, the point vierge, where we are one with all reality. One day, far back in the mists of the Old Testament, our great patriarch father, Abraham, was sitting, minding his own business under the Mamre tree. I'm sure you know this beautiful story. When he saw coming across the desert sands three figures, three strangers, three strange angels, he rushed to meet them because he recognised beyond them who they were. And... Uh, he invited them to sit, refresh themselves, and they did that. And he killed a calf for them. He got his wife to bake bread for them. At the end of it all, uh, when they were getting ready to leave, they said they would come back this time next year. And your wife, Sarah, will have a son. And Sarah was listening to him. She was about 89 at the time. 
and she was, she was in the tent, and she giggled, and they heard her giggling. And Abraham kind of threw his eyes to heaven as well and says, sure, we'll see you next year. And of course the child was born, and that child was Isaac. There is the beautiful icon of that particular meeting uh, from Rubloff, which I'm sure you all know. They call it the Trinity. So the three strange angels in uh, our uh, time, in our testament, are the Trinity, or God, in other words. In other words. So Abraham and Sarah at that advanced age had a son Isaac and the world started again. One of the lessons that I draw from that is our need to trust in moments of vision, in visitations of the unexpected, in what we call epiphanies. This is where the submission to the call of poetry enters my tale. To walk in quietness across the sand is to hear the shush, shush, shush of the suffering soul and the approach of three strange angels. If you can see beyond the mere physical and worldly three people that arrive to what lies beyond, then you are reaching deeper into your being and into your soul. And these three strange angels, in our time, have they disappeared? Has the sense of epiphany and wonder and newness disappeared from the face of the earth? Gabriel Daly, in a book he called The Church Always in Need of Reform, has written, Christians are pilgrims, and like Abraham, they are sent on a journey with their epiphanies, not knowing where they are to go. So our journey, our pilgrimage, is the journey of the soul. I want to introduce my first angel to you. My brother, Declan, who became a Jesuit priest, who suffered years and years of alcohol addiction, uh, but was a very good priest and worked in Portadown, left Ireland and went to live in San Francisco, where he became a pastor. This is a memory I have of himself and myself young on a lake in Bunakari on Ackle Island called the Lake of the Singing Birds. We built our own boat from bits and pieces and scraps and uh, were always out on this very dangerous lake which was an enormous bog hole. Um, our mother always giving out blazes to us for going up there. Uh, but it was just a wonderful place to risk your life in this thing. I call this little piece uh, The Unheard Music. It was a moment of extraordinary epiphany. And then, in our sleeky, homemade boat, out on the lake, we both fell silent. The oars lifted and dripping water on the surface, soft, softly. Something incomprehensible holding us, a fragrance breathing from the heathers, the low hills embracing us, and lake water tapping gently against the timber bones of the craft. And we drifted, a long, sustaining moment in unannounced communion, as childhood drew nearer to the rough rock shores, and our leaning bodies were growing firmer towards the tasks ahead, until we rowed again, oars raking against the rollocks, silence persisting deep within us, swelling to a form of prayer. He announced to me that he was thinking of joining the Jesuits, and uh, that was my response. We went our separate ways. He became a Jesuit priest, and eventually went to be pastor in a small, sunlit place called Pleasant Hill. He had suffered years from alcohol. Uh, he sloughed it off and uh, did it enormously well. He died aged 69. 
from cancer of the esophagus there in Pleasant Hill. He had become very well known as a presence outside San Quentin jail, the only time he ever rode, ro wore his Roman collar to say that uh, Roman Catholic priests are against the death sentence. When I went to his funeral out there, uh, a girl came up to me who told me she was chaplain in San Quentin on death row and that when they heard of Declan's death, they all got together and asked the, their pastor to say mass for Declan, which I found a very moving moment. Then he visited me about a year or so after his death. I had been with a group from Maynooth with my wife Ursula in the Holy Land on pilgrimage. And one day as we left the Lake of Galilee after its regular storm, uh, we got on the bus to go back to our hotel and we passed a place down on the left which looked a, a ruin and I asked the guide who actually was called Abraham, I asked him uh, what, what's that ruin down there and he said oh that's Magdala, they are excavating it and I said oh can we stop and have a look, he said no no it's, it's blocked off for the moment. So who rose up in my mind except uh, the wonderful saintly Mary Magdalene at that moment. Today it happens to be her feast day, a sheer coincidence. But she is here with us today now, another strange angel arriving with us. Anyway, I want to tell a story about that, my memory of that particular day and that particular moment. This is true in one way and true in another way as well. Um, <coughs> it's called an encounter. It is March. In Ireland, daffodils will be suffering the harshest winds. Here, the coach has turned back from the slopes of the Beatitude towards Tiberius. To the right, the valleys, green and flush, rising to the hills. To the left, the lake, quietened in an evening lull and pleasuring. I settled in my seat, comforted and tired. When, and this is my wakeful dream, this is a happening, this is real. In the coach seats opposite, father, fisherman and March month birthday boy, and brother, Declan, impatient God lover, picketer by the gates of San Quentin, celebrant of falling free at last from alcohol addiction, both of them in animated conversation both of them dead for years and months. They spoke in a language without words, song-like, seductive. Outside, darkness was falling, the sun a dying fire, light catching on the thorn of the moon that was lying idle in a sapphire-shaded heaven. Soon, there would be shimmering silver nightways out across the sea. Father suddenly called to me and pointed. The bus stopped and we stepped down, we three only. Silently they walked across the grass, down towards the shore. Drawn and confused, I followed. The light so faint now, all was shadow. Father, old friend and faithful, Declan, brother and priest. The old man turned to me and smiled. We, he said, we are not in death. We are in life. He pointed. There was another standing near the lake, her back towards us. She was watching out over the water, frail-boned, slight but firm. Mother, I said. And she turned slowly. I did not know her. Fair-skinned. Handsome, but not beautiful. Your name? I asked. Miriam, she said. Miriam of Magdil. And yours? Johanan, I answered, to my surprise. Around us, ruins only, excavations, stone heaps, stumps, and Magdil? It was here, 
she said. He stepped ashore from the fishing boat and stood a while gazing towards the hills. I was kneeling there by that great rock. I was gutting fish for salting. I worried for his feet naked against the sharp edges of the shells. The others, fishermen, moved awkwardly, hauling the boat ashore, uncertain of themselves. And who are you? I asked him, though I already knew the answer. He is the way. He is the life. And his truth will sear both soul and body. And he said, Miriam, as if he knew me. If I give, he said, word of myself, what can that be to you? Come and see. And I left fish and shore, lake and village, and followed him. He is invasion, hero, mystery. He is the centre. He is forgiveness, light. And now I, she said, I am in death no longer. I am in life. She smiled, turning back towards the sea. I glanced for father and brother, but they were not there. And I turned again. She too had disappeared. I shivered suddenly, alone and cold. A black-backed gull perched on the great rock was stabbing down at some small feathered thing. Now it was night. From the road, Abram was calling out to me. And I came back at peace, heavy and in flesh, but free. <coughs> Excuse the throat, it's still a little bit hazy, hazy. Oh, 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 thank you. Don't worry. That's my first strange angel. A visitation, an epiphany. Um, an illumination. Um, I remember Seamus Heaney once upon a time said to me uh, that that poem was he what he would call permeable. So uh, I said, gee, thanks. What does that mean? He said, the opposite to permeable is impermeable. Um, so you put up the French word for an umbrella is impermeable and impermeable, it doesn't allow the rain in. If you're permeable, you throw away your umbrella and you let the world in. You accept, you accept the strangeness. You accept the absurdity, if you like. You accept uh, all these things that are mysteries and you let them in without resistance. Second strange angel uh, came to me as a stranger when I was maybe 24, 25, I had left the priesthood and was stuck for something to do. And a guy came up to me with a tattered old booklet and he said, read that, you'll like it. So I said, gee, thanks. It was a collection of the poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins, uh, whom I had never heard of at that stage of my life. I opened it. Uh, and read where you shouldn't begin reading Gerard Manny Hopkins if you know his work at all. You do not start with the wreck of the Deutschland, which begins, Thou mastering me, God, giver of breath and bread, world, strand, sway of the sea, Lord of the living and dead, thou hast bound bones and veins in me, fastened me flesh. And it goes on like that for a long time. Uh, I hadn't a clue what was going on, but the sound of it went up and down my spine. I was hooped, and I was hooped, uh, into poetry. Years after that, I went on retreat to uh, what they called a Gerard Manny Hopkins retreat in a place called St. Binos in North Wales, where Hopkins actually did his theology and philosophy. And uh, we prayed Gerard Manny Hopkins. We prayed with the poems. And uh, I fell in love again with Hopkins while realizing that I was also simultaneously, and I think he, he was the one who pointed it out to me, that deep within me is a love, an absolute love for the physical world in which we live. 
North Wales is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, hilly, tree, uh, everything you can expect. Not nearly as beautiful as the other place, which is the most beautiful, which is Achill Island, which of course has everything that ne you need. So when I left Achill, I realized how much I loved it. Hopkins has a wonderful poem, uh, which is called God's Grandeur, where suddenly the world uh, springs to you as the most wonderful thing that God can offer us. As a Roman Catholic, when I was being brought up, and then again when I was trying to be a priest, I was told, you reject the world. Uh, eyes down, custody of the eyes, custody of everything. Don't, don't let anything in. Be impermeable to the world outside. He has God's grandeur. And that it begins with, the world is charged. And that's two things. The world is charged with the grandeur of God, which means it's electric. God goes through the world like electric, electricity. It's charged. But it also means uh, we are charged with the grandeur of the world. We are to sustain and keep that world safe. We are charged with the grandeur of God as well. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. But for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. And though the last lights of the black west went, O oh morning at the bright brink eastward, springs because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. So it is Hopkins brought me this uh, earth love, this need to love the earth, this need to take care of this earth. Um, I'm going to read another poem by another great hero of mine, poet, uh, George Herbert. You know all of these guys, of course you do. Um, there is <coughs> Hopkins, Heaney, Herbert, the three H's. Uh, there's a great uh, professional wrestler in the United States of America who is called Triple H. So these are my, this is my Triple H, heavyweight wrestlers for poetry and for God. Herbert has a poem called Love. Um, it's a gently dramatic poem where the title may refer to physical love, a lover, uh, justice, peace, truth, God, Christ, all of that. But obviously for Herbert it meant God. So it's a dramatic invitation of the soul to come in. A tiny little poem with an entire drama, your drama, my drama, in it. Love bade me welcome. But my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, 
but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, said love, and share my meat. So I did sit and eat. Hopkins uh, has a great poem also called uh, The Wind Hover. I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight, Stofan. And it ends up with uh, my heart in hiding, my heart in hiding, stirred for a bird, the kestrel, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. And he has towards the end of that poem, he has that little phrase, ah, my dear, the one that's in Jeremy Hopkins. And he says, Hopkins says, in yielding to the love that George Herbert was being invited in, Hopkins writes, the frown of his face before, the hurtle of hell behind, where, where, was, a, where was the place? I whirled out wings that spell and fled with a fling of the heart to the heart of the host. My heart, but you are dove-winged, I can tell. Carrier-witted, I am bold to boast, to flash from the flame to the flame, then tower from the grace to the grace. I fled with a fling of the heart to the heart of the host. I yielded, I gave in, I opened up, I became permeable. Two angels out of the way. <clears throat> um, I spent the best part of five years as a novice and a seminarian, studying for the priesthood, obviously following my brother Declan as far as I could, but I didn't get very far. Um, not as a Jesuit, I was taught by the Jesuits and that was enough for me. I got out of the Jesuits. But the Holy Ghost Fathers, maybe there's something again there that I'm seeking the Holy Ghost. I want the spirit uh, to be open to it. I did my novitiate with 48 others, believe it or not. There were 48 of us entered the novitiate together. One of them was from the island of Mauritius, a man called Maurice, Maurice Piat, who had no English but spoke French only. Because I had come from a Mungret college, Jesuit school, I had French. So I was kind of deputed to teach him English, to sp spend time with him, to be with him. Um, though as a, as a novice and a seminarian, you're supposed to be very remote from each other. But uh, we got on extremely well together. I liked him very much. We got on well. So his name is Maurice Piat. We also went on further and did French and English in university together as seminarians. So I was being uh, guided to be one of the teachers, perhaps eventually in Black Rock or Rockwell or somewhere like that. Now we, being very good seminarians, we always stayed in class, even uh, to the bitter end. And one particular morning, uh, we had a French lecturer due in and he never turned up. So gradually everybody else left the classroom, but no, we wouldn't. We were obedient. We sat on to the bitter end waiting until he realized he had something new in his pocket and he drew out a little booklet uh, in French which had just arrived from somebody in Mauritius at the time. We're talking about 1964 now. Um, this, I had never heard of this man before. It was a little booklet in French uh, called um, La Messe sur le monde, the Mass over the world. And it was by one Teilhard de Chardin. And uh, Maurice began to read and translate, and I began to read and translate. And I was absolutely bowled over by the notion the thing was beautiful in French. French poetry is, is very rationalistic and doesn't appeal to me generally. But Théard de Chardin was very sensual. 
and uh, we translated a little bit as we went along, and uh, it was it was so exciting for me, so new, so different, that the world was was to be his altar, that the bread that he was offering up as a priest to God was the labor of humanity, and that the blood that he was changing into the wine of Christ, the, the wine changed into the blood of Christ, uh, was in fact the suffering of humanity, and that humanity was in evolution. We were evolving towards the great omega at the end, uh, the omega being also Christ. Now, uh, that was uh, a revelation to me as well. The book was. I tried to find more of Thierry de Chardin, but as you know, the church did not allow him to be published or read anywhere. So he was not to be found in the seminary. And it was many years later. When I went out to my brother's funeral in uh, America, I met a, a friend of Declan's, a, a local professor called Michael P. Murphy. And we got on very well together and had a good chat about Declan and uh, Declan and Michael had been very good friends. In the year 2016, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I got an email inviting me to come to be the Teilhard de Chardin Fellow in the Loyola University in Chicago and to give talks on poetry to the students out there. And it was signed Michael P. Murphy. It was a big fee offered as well, and a house uh, by the lake, Lake Michigan, out there. So I said, yep, off we go. Uh, the email came, I believe, not from, Thier, from uh, Michael Murphy, but from Teilhard de Chardin. Um, and I had a, an absolutely difficult, tough time. But it worked. So Teilhard de Chardin, uh, in fact, is my third strange angel. One of the first emails I got while I was in Chicago, about a week later, was from a friend in Ireland saying that a new cardinal, several new cardinals had been made by the, the Pope at the time, one of whom turned out to be Maurice Piat. He's now Cardinal Archbishop of Mauritius. So if these are all coincidences and all not directed by Declan and Hopkins and Herbert and Teilhard de Chardin, then uh, I am uh, in trouble. I see that I am drawing to a close, that the time is actually falling in upon us. I had another about 55 minutes to go, but I'm, uh, I might actually slow it down uh, and finish off with a few little summary things. What I figure is that we are, through Hopkins, through Herbert and all of that, and especially through Théard de Chardin, that our soul, the soul, is in fact part of the cosmic soul, and that we are part of uh, an evolution which we are calling, which is termed cosmogenesis, and includes uh, all that you've been hearing this morning, only bits of it which I heard, uh, the transhumanism and all of that stuff is incorporated in the notion that the human soul is unlimited uh, and moving forward towards cosmogenesis, towards unity. Hard to believe with what's going on over in Russia, but there you go. Um, in her latest novel called Jack, a wonderful novelist called Marilyn Robinson uh, has one of her characters speak of the recognition of the soul of another person. And she writes, a soul has no earthly qualities, no history of the things of this world, no guilt, no injury, no failures, no more than a flame would have. There is nothing to be said about it except that it is a holy human soul. And it is a miracle when you recognize it when you hold yourself open to the world, that is the miracle. 
I began the little talk by opening the red gate. I'm going to finish it off, guess, by closing the red gate. Uh, this is the same gate. Uh, this poem was written because one evening I was so permeable that by the time I came back up from the red gate, the poem had written itself. And I call it Canticle. Sometimes when you walk down to the red gate, hearing the scrape music of your shoes across gravel, a yellow moon will lift over the hill. You swing the gate shut and lean on the topmost bar as if something has been accomplished in the world. A night wind missiles through the poplar leaves and all the noise of the universe stills to an oboe hum, the given note of a perfect music. There is a vast sky wholly dedicated to the stars and you know with certainty that all the dead are out up there in one holiday flotilla, and that they celebrate the fact of a red gate and a yellow moon that tunes their instruments with you to the symphony. I'm going to leave it at that. I was told to tell you, um, I didn't ask to be told to tell you, that uh, the newest book that I have out is called Naming of the Bones. It costs £12.99 sterling and is available at the back there for €10. Euro. Uh, it would be nice if you wanted to have a copy. Uh, the poems are not bad, mind you, inside of it. I know because I actually have read them, so um, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>